to Open Book, Episode 12, How to Read Shakespeare's Villains, focusing on Iago from Othello. I'm Michael Elliott, Associate Professor of English at the University of Calgary. And today's topic is the last in a three-part series on Shakespeare's villains. These episodes are a little different from my usual format. They focus on a single character from one or more of Shakespeare's plays, and each episode examines one villain's characteristics, language, and role in their genre, namely tragedy or history. These episodes are also a bit less formally structured than others this season, with fewer musical interludes and a more conversational style. As before in previous episodes, we'll talk first about the genre of the play in which this villain appears, We'll then look at some of his main characteristics and the way that he enacts his villainy and the way that he brings about the downfall of the heroic characters. And of course, we will spend a lot of time looking at the rhetoric uh, that he uses, but this one will be a little bit different. Iago is a different sort of character from Richard and from Aaron in that so much of what he says is in conversation with others in which we discover not merely by him standing up and making declamatory statements but really by his insinuation and his workings into and onto the minds of his conversants the people he speaks to most significantly Othello of course Uh, that's the way that you see his villainy in action he is a master manipulator of others. But I'm getting ahead of myself. First, let's look at the tragedy genre of Othello, which makes it similar to Titus Andronicus in the last episode. Othello is one of Shakespeare's four most famous tragedies, the other three being Hamlet, King Lear, and Macbeth. And Othello is really famous for Iago's malicious and diabolical character, his diabolical plot, that is, to work on Othello's suspicion of his wife, whom he falsely accuses of infidelity with a man named Michael Cassio, whom Othello has advanced before Iago. And that's Iago's motive. He is envious and resentful, and he turns that slight, his missed promotion, into the purest form of malice. Without Iago, there is no tragedy in this story. He's the prime mover of the story. He's the orchestrator of the tragedy. He is the the manipulator par excellence. He insinuates his way, as I said, into Othello's mind, and he does it using really subtle techniques. He orchestrates evidence at the same time to incriminate Cassio. He actually plants a handkerchief on Cassio that Othello once gave to Desdemona, which she drops. And as a result of Iago's plots and his insinuations and what he turns Othello into, which is a jealous husband who is certain of the correctness of his suspicions, As a result of all that, Othello murders Desdemona. He then discovers the false plot that Iago has orchestrated, and in despair, he condemns Iago first, but then stabs himself. We're going to start at the end of this play by looking at the closing speeches of um, Othello and Iago. Iago actually is remarkably um, remarkably reluctant to say anything. He refuses to answer Othello's question. This is Act 5, Scene 2, line 295. Othello asks him, Will you, I pray, demand that demi-devil why he hath thus ensnared my soul and body? And Iago's response is, is flat-out refusal. He says, demand me nothing. What you know, you know. From this time forth, I never will speak word. And he doesn't. At the end of the play, uh, Iago is taken away for an inquiry. The, uh, the last 
couple, the last speech mentions the censure of this hellish villain, Iago, namely, and that he is not, we don't see the justice of the inquiry. We don't see that outcome. What we see instead is Othello lamenting tragically that he has been susceptible to Iago's influence. Then, as he says on line 339, following Act 5, Scene 2, Then must you speak of one that loved not wisely but too well, of one not easily jealous, but being wrought, perplexed in the extreme. Wrought is an interesting word choice. It means made. It means fashioned into something. He has been made into the jealous husband in, uh, or rather by Iago's manipulations. So let's skip now all the way back to the first scene of the first act. The very first conversation is between Iago and his friend Rodrigo, in which Rodrigo says, you told me, thou toldst me, thou didst hold him in thy hate, and him is Othello. Iago then rehearses the fact that Othello has chosen Michael Cassio, as his officer, uh, whereas Iago will be his ancient. These are just slightly different. Uh, the ancient is, is a slightly lower rank uh, in Iago's military service. Iago is determined not to rise to this occasion. In fact, he's not going to meet the requirements of service. He's going to merely pretend to do so. He says in line 48, others there are who trimmed in forms and visages of duty, that is the appearances of duty, keep yet their hearts attending on themselves and throwing but shows of service on their lords do well thrive by them. And when they have lined their coats do themselves homage. These fellows have some soul and such a one do I profess myself. A few lines later he says, in following him, that is e e Othello, I follow but myself. And he closes this, this opening, one of this, this, this uh, outlining um, speech at the beginning with the memorable line that's paradoxical, I am not what I am. He means that he is going to conceal his heart. He is not going to, as he puts it, wear it on its sleeve for daws, that is uh, small crows or fools, to peck at. Very shortly after this, Iago and Rodrigo get embroiled in a controversy in Venice in which the father of Desdemona, Brabantio, gets very exercised, very worked up over the fact that his daughter has fallen in love with a moor. And the controversy results in a public trial, which is very humiliating in certain ways and very exposing of their love, but ultimately Othello uh, prevails and they, they leave her father's house and depart for Cyprus, where Othello and the others have a military campaign to pursue. Meanwhile, of course, Iago harbors his resentment. And at the end of Act 1, Scene 3, he has a long speech in which he thinks aloud and seemingly uh, devises his plan against Othello in real time while he's speaking. Here's what he says, Act 1, Scene 3, line 372 following. I hate the moor, he says, and it is thought abroad that twixt my sheets he's done my office. That is to say, Iago, who's married to Emilia, thinks that possibly Othello has slept with his own wife. I know not if to be true, he adds, but I, for mere suspicion in that kind, will do as if for surety. He holds me well, that is, he thinks well of me. The better shall my purpose work on him. And now Iago devises his plan. Cassio's a proper man, let me see now to get his place and to plume up my will in double knavery. How? How? Let's see. After some time to abuse Othello's ears that he is too familiar with his wife. He hath a person 
and a smooth disposed to be suspected, framed to make women false. The moor is of a free and open nature that thinks men honest that but seem to be so, and will as tenderly be led by the nose as asses are. I have it. It is engendered. That is, the plan is engendered. Hell and night must bring this monstrous birth to the world's light. There is one more significant speech early-ish in the play, in Acts 2, scene 1, line 276. Iago repeats the allegation that, quote, I do suspect the lusty moor hath leaped into my seat, the thought whereof doth like a poison mineral, sorry, like a poisonous mineral gnaw my innards, and nothing can or shall content my soul till I am evened with him, wife for wife. Or failing so, yet that I put the moor at least into a jealousy so strong that judgment cannot cure. And yet, Iago still doesn't know how he's going to do it. He is waiting for the right opportunity, and soon enough it comes. When Cassio falls out of favor with Othello, he turns to, of all people, Iago who appears to be quite honest, appears to be a good person who would help others. Uh, And he turns then to him and asks for help. Iago is very willing to give him advice, advises him, in fact, to go speak to Desdemona, to have her plead on his behalf to her husband. How am I then a villain? asks Iago to the audience. This is Act 2, Scene 3, line 319 following. How am I then a villain to counsel Cassio to this parallel course directly to his good? He's pretending that he is being innocent and helpful. And then he gives a, a nice parallel. Divinity of hell, when devils will the blackest sins put on, they do suggest at first with heavenly shows, as I do now, for... Whiles this honest fool plies Desdemona to repair his fortune, and she for him pleads strongly to the moor, I'll pour this pestilence into his ear, that she repeals him for her body's lust. And by how much she strives to do him good, she shall undo her credit with the moor. So will I turn her virtue into pitch, and out of her own goodness make the net that shall enmesh them all. Pitch literally means tar. It means something that is going to trap them. And that's the probably the most famous line. It's the line that is on the front cover of the Broadview Internet Shakespeare editions of this play that I'm consulting. It's on the it's it's really the, the best summation of Iago's method. Turn her virtue into pitch, and make the net that shall enmesh them all, out of her own goodness. That is really Iago's characteristic feature. It makes him most similar to another villain, namely Edmund in King Lear, the bastard son of Gloucester, and the uh, one who really undoes his father and uh, betrays his brother in order to meet his own ambition. If that sounds familiar, it should. It's much like Richard of Gloucester, who murders his own family members in order to advance his interests. One of the things that makes Iago different, however, from Richard and from Aaron, is that he is the consummate insider. He is not an outsider in this world, except for the fact that he doesn't get the advancement, doesn't get the position that he wants. There's no sense of otherness. He's um, a powerful person in this world, a person that people listen to, that others listen to. And most tragically, uh, the one who listens to him is Othello, the one who is other, the one who is a moor. Nevertheless, he's a general, but still, he is marginalized racially, accordingly treated with suspicion in many instances. It is Iago, however, who is alienated. Iago, who is self-alienated because he decides that he is going to do whatever it takes in order to work his his revenge on those that he believes has done have done him wrong 
Let's turn now to Act 3, Scene 3 and look at how Iago actually does his manipulation. This is immediately after uh, Cassio has spoken to Desdemona and Desdemona on his behalf has, has spoken to Othello. Othello and Desdemona have just parted company. Othello saying the prescient words, I suppose, the unintentionally ironic words, perdition, catch my soul, but I do love thee, and when I love thee not, chaos is come again. This is Act 3, Scene 3, lines 88 through 90. Iago then takes, takes Othello aside, and they have a conversation. The conversation in which he insinuates his way into Iago's mind. Iago asks casually if Cassio knew of Othello's love for Desdemona when they met, and claims, kind of with false nonchalance, that this was just for a satisfaction of my thought, line 95. Othello then has an increasing, a growing sense of of suspicion, you could say. He says to, to Iago, Thou echoest me as if there were some monster in thy thought, too hideous to be shown. Remember that word, monster. It's going to come back again. He says, If thou dost love me, show me thy thought. He asks Iago to share. And Iago then says in response, he starts to say that he believes um, Cassio to be honest. That is another very significant word. And so let's remember that word when we see the kinds of... Uh, it's a word that gets, that it gets often assigned to Iago himself, but Iago doesn't deserve it. The word honest means trustworthy. It means someone who won't betray you. It doesn't merely mean someone who will tell you the truth. It means far more than that. I think he is honest, Iago says of Cassio. And Iago goes on to say, men should be what they seem. Now we know that that is directly contrary to what he has said before, I am not what I am. I will be opposite of what I seem, in other words. I think Cassio is an honest man, Iago continues. Othello can tell that there's more at work in Iago's insinuations, or there's more behind the words that he's saying, and he grows less patient. He says in 131, Nay, yet there's more in this. I prithee, speak to me as to thy thinkings. As thou dost ruminate and give thy worst of thoughts, the worst of words. He's asking, in other words, asking Iago to lay out his suspicions. I do beseech you, Iago replies, 145, though I perchance am vicious in my guesses, I confess it is my nature's plague to spy into abuses and oft my jealousy shapes faults that are not. That is to say, look, I am a suspicious person by nature. 149, he continues, that your wisdom from one that so imperfectly conceits, that is, imagines, would take no notice, nor build yourself a trouble out of his scattering and unsure observance. Look, don't trouble yourself. This is just going to be nothing, I'm sure. If it, sorry, go on, uh, going on uh, 152, uh, 153 rather, it were not for your quiet, nor your good, nor for my manhood, honesty, and wisdom to let you know my thoughts. And Othello, however, insists and the reason that he, Iago, is pretending to be reluctant is he says to protect Othello from jealousy. Oh, one six, line 165. Oh, beware, my lord of jealousy. It is the green-eyed monster with which doth mock the meat it feeds on. Now the word is dropped. Now the idea is more direct, although Iago has sidled his way up to it in a very indirect way. The word jealousy. The souls of all my tribe defend from jealousy. So he's, he says in 175 following, so he's being very, he's dropping it in as a, a thing to be feared, a thing to be avoided, uh, that certainty is far better. And Othello agrees that 
Uh, thinkst thou I'd make a life of jealousy, he says, to follow still the changes of the moon with fresh suspicions? That's ridiculous. Of course you wouldn't do that. No, Iago, Lion 189, I'll see before I doubt, and when I doubt, prove, and on the proof, there is no more but this, a way at once with love or jealousy. And Iago pretends to be uh, relieved to hear it. He says, I'm glad of this, for now... I shall have reason to show the love and duty that I bear you with franker spirit. Now, he's saying, I will be able to disclose things to you without this kind of reluctance and this resistance. I know that you're not susceptible to jealousy, of course, so now let me be more frank. I speak not yet of proof, he says, but then here he drops the accusation. Look to your wife. Observe her well with Cassio, wear your eyes thus. This is how you should look at her. And a bit further on, he reminds Othello that Desdemona deceived her father, Brabantio. She did deceive her father, marrying you. She seems a certain way, but we don't know that she isn't capable of deception. This has a pretty d damaging and immediate effect on, Iago, on Othello, he is immediately starting to entertain the suspicion, and the turn comes very shortly after that. Othello says, I, I am not that much moved, he insists. I do not think, but Desdemona is honest. I can't really imagine that she wouldn't be trustworthy and loyal to me. And yet, how nature erring, or rather erring from itself, it does sometimes depart from its own nature, that goodness, that honesty. And it is by the end of this scene, Act 3, Scene 3, that Othello is certainly convinced. He has been thoroughly convinced because, again, of his belief, his faith in Iago's character, and also the way that Iago has insinuated um, has made his insinuations, has said to Othello to beware of a thing, which Othello feels quite, that certainly builds Iago's credibility. Uh, and then Othello slowly convinces himself that this could be true. And by the close of this scene, uh, once Iago leaves and then returns, and tells him to stop worrying about it, etc. And Othello thanks him quite honestly. He is convinced firmly. This fellow's of exceeding honesty, he says. Everything rests on Iago's credibility. This fellow's of exceeding honesty, 257, and knows all qualities with a learned spirit of human dealings. And he is then, by the end of the speech, convinced. She's gone. Line 266. I am abused, and my relief must be to loathe her. Oh, curse of marriage, that we can call these delicate creatures ours, and not their appetites. He is fully won over. Or at least he is fully compelled by the possibility, and beholden to the possibility, which he will now look to confirm. However, there is hope for Othello. A moment ago, I said it was at the end of the scene. I was wrong. It's actually a scene that goes on for a lot longer because Othello then returns to the subject with Iago, calls him a villain, line 357. Villain, be sure thou prove my love a whore. Be sure of it. Give me the ocular proof. If thou, this is a bit further down, 366, if thou dost slander her and torture me, never pray more. Abandon all remorse on Herer's head. Horrors accumulate. Do deeds to make heaven weep, all earth amazed. For nothing canst thou add to damnation add greater than that. Iago then has this, pre pre uh, this presentation, this performance, rather, of honesty, of remorse. Oh, take note, world, to be direct and honest is not safe. And Othello says, no, you should be honest. I think my wife be honest and think she is not. Othello says, I think that thou art just and think thou art not. I'll have some proof. Proof is what he needs. Proof is what he's going to get, which Iago is going to invent the handkerchief that I mentioned. Proof is the deciding 
factor that is going to reconcile these irreconcilable opposites, what he believes and what he is now allowing himself to suspect, what he knows of her and what Iago has insinuated about her. That is, the truth versus the fiction of her infidelity. So all Iago now has to do is orchestrate that proof, the ocular proof, as Othello calls it. All he needs to do is orchestrate the, the theft of the handkerchief, which Desdemona drops, the planting of the handkerchief, which Iago's is assisted in by his wife, Emilia, and then the presentation of that evidence to Othello. And all of those things happen. That is exactly the way that he convinces Othello to believe Iago's words and not his own eyes, his own mind. And it is ultimately also Iago's undoing because his wife, Emilia, feels more pangs of remorse than her husband. She, it is, who confesses the crime. She comes forward. She betrays Iago, to her credit. He then murders her, but still she is vindicated. She is, she does the right, exactly the right thing. And Iago is then accused, uh, but not before Desdemona suffers from the consequences of Iago's, sorry, of Othello's jealousy, of Iago's machinations, and is murdered by Othello. And so the net does indeed enmesh them all. Listening to Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature with Michael Elliott. The next episode returns to our regularly scheduled programming, so to speak, with the second in a two part series on Miguel de Cervantes' Don Quixote. The first part was in episode eight. Meanwhile, you can search me up in the usual places. It should turn up my blog if you spell my surname U L L Y O T. Or go straight there by typing j.mp slash Elliot. You can also find me on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter in descending order of regularity. And then there's old-fashioned email, Elliot at ucalgary.ca. That's U-C-A-L-G-A-R-Y dot C-A. The music from this episode is courtesy of the Open Well-Tempered Clavier Project and performed by Kimiko Ishizaka.